for joining the 2021 Mineral Symposium of the Pacific Northwest Chapter of Friends of Mineralogy. This is our second virtual symposium because of the current health restrictions imposed because of the ongoing global pandemic. So we're glad that you're able to join us here today. Our 2021 theme is Minerals of Africa and our next speaker is once again, Bruce Cairncross of Johannesburg, South Africa. Bruce obtained his master's degree from the University of Natal in 1979. And after working as a geologist with the Rand Mines Limited uh, Coal Division, he joined the University of Witwatersrand Rand and obtained his PhD in 1986. He then joined uh, the Rand's Afrikaans University, RAU, geology department, where he served as the head of the department for 14 years from 2003 to 2016, during which time RAU merged with the Witwatersrand Technicon to form the University of Johannesburg. And he is currently professor of geology at the University of Johannesburg. Bruce is a prolific author and is co -auth has authored 11 books on South African minerals and gemstones and over 150 articles on the same subject. He serves on the editorial boards of the Mineralogical Record and Rocks and Minerals magazine, and many of his articles have, have appeared in those two magazines. He is an accomplished photographer and, is, uh, and has won local and international awards for his photographs. And now here's Bruce Cairncross with his second talk, Minerals, Mines, and Geology of Namibia. Well, thanks very much, Julian. Um, I really appreciate this invitation that you've extended to me to give uh, this talk today and uh, the one afterwards as well. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to speak about our local Southern African mines and the minerals. And um, I am really looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Okay, the talk I'm going to present today is, on, is based on a trip that we did in 2017 through Namibia. And um, as you can see from the title, uh, it'll involve mines and minerals and a bit of geology. So it's a bit of a mix. And I thought I would show slides and pictures uh, of the country, um, primarily if you haven't been there, or even if you have, there might be some things which you recognize or areas that you may be familiar with. So just to first of all explain the route, um, we went for uh, about two and a half weeks um, into Namibia, left Johannesburg um, and traveled through Botswana, coming in the eastern part of Namibia. And we came in over here where you can see the map of Namibia. And then we did this round trip that I've shown here in red pen, and that's the route we'll be following. And did approximately 3,100 kilometers in the country. And with the trip to and fro there, it came to about 5,000 kilometers all round. So it was a pretty long trip, and um, it, it involved a lot of driving on dirt roads as well, but it was highly enjoyable. So these are the localities I'm going to be discussing, and there are 12 in total. Um, and again, there might be some with which you are familiar, I'm sure, like Sumeb, for example, and Bach Arcus, but there might be some others as well that you're not that familiar with. So it's a lot of localities to, to actually cover in the time available, so let's get going. So first of all, just the geology of Namibia, of the whole country, of, of just a few important um, parts of it, let's say. What you see here in color, the, um, the blue, the, the red, and the yellow is essentially Precambrian rocks, as you can see from, this, from the legend down below here, Mesoproterozoic, Neoproterozoic, and then the yellow are basically sedimentary rocks of what's called the Nama group, which is late Precambrian. Now, the red and the blue are assigned to what's called the Damara, the Damara supergroup and granite. And it is these rocks that host a lot of the economic ore deposits in Namibia. So this, if you like, is the older geology of the country. This slide is the younger rocks. If you look at the ages here, what's called the Karoo supergroup, uh, and again, the Damara Igneous province, these are essentially Carboniferous up into the Cretaceous from about 300 million years old to less than 250 million years. And 
although looking at the color on the map, the 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 uh, rocks aren't as plentiful or as widespread as the Precambrian geology. It's this Damara Igneous province up here in the northwest part of the country that plays an important role in some of the mineral localities that I'll be that I'll be speaking about. So that just is to sort of lay the background of the geology. So we covered all aspects of the country and its geology. So starting off, we drove in through the eastern border into Namibia, along the main road here to the capital of Vintuk, and then drove just down south a few tens of kilometers to Aris. Now, Aris is one of these um, deposits. It's actually a quarry. It's not a mine where economic minerals are mined, but there are a couple of quarries in this phonolite that um, the rock is actually quarried for road metal and for use on the roads and as ballast on the railway lines. And it is a yellow, it's a relatively young um, age deposit. You can see 33 million years. And the phonolite, which is basically um, intrusive uh, form of a cyanite, hosts a great variety of different types of minerals. Most are micro minerals. And in fact, the the, um, the micro mounters are probably pretty familiar with um, some of the minerals that come from here. Mundat lists 117 species and six type locality species. So it has got a very diverse assemblage of minerals. So here's a, a panoramic view of, of, one of, the, of one of the quarries at, um, uh, um, at Aris. And if you just look at, to the map on the left, there's the capital Vintuk. So it's just south on the road to Riaboth. And on the right-hand side here, the map of the geology of the rocks, um, this is basically the phonolite down here, the red, but you can see it's got the Aris Kop quarry and the railway quarry. So there's more than one. This is the so-called Aris Kop, and in the distance is the railway quarry. Now, with this locality and with all of the ones that I'll be speaking about, um, they require permission to be visited. You can't just arrive at the operation and expect to be let in. So all of this was done by prior arrangement and it took quite a few weeks to organize as well. In the middle here is a specimen of one of the iconic species, which is Tupersutsiite. And again, it's a micro mineral. That's a, uh, only a, a few, maybe half, half a centimeter in size. So in each of these um, stops or localities, um, I'll show you some of uh, the minerals. Obviously the time, it's, it's not possible to go through in any depth in any of these, but um, I'll show you some. So here's a close-up of the far side of the quarry, and the arrow is showing you the contact here between the phonolite below and above here are the Precambrian rocks of the Damara. So this is where the phonolite is now actually cut into these ancient rocks. Here's a close-up of um, one of the specimens in my collection, and the, the field of view is small, 1.3 centimeters. The cavities and the vugs in the phonolite tend to be small, m usually less than about five centimeters and even smaller. So that's why the minerals tend to be micro. There are occasions when the vugs get to be quite large, though. So this is lined with um, the white albite, and again, these hair-like sprays of the of the tupersuitsiite. It's basically an alkaline silicate. This is a larger vug, four and a half centimeters, the field of view, and again showing the tupersuitsiite with what may be natural light, or there are other species of uh, rare minerals um, from, from the deposit. And I actually haven't really analyzed this to be sure. And I think it may be natural light, the more, um, the more common one, with white small tabular crystals of albite and the agerine. When you um, are in the quarry and you are hammering the phonolite, it is extremely hard. It's like hitting a blacksmith's anvil, steel. Your hammer just pings back at you. And one has to be extremely careful for shards of rock that come flying out. This is another one of the minerals from there, volumite, which is a sodium fluoride. It's um, a member of the halite group, and it is water-soluble, and it's also toxic. So um, one needs to be a bit careful if you wash this which is quite a large crystal, two and a half centimeters. If you wash it, you won't have anything left afterwards, which could be a bit of a problem. So that's a quick stop at Aris. We then drive up back through into Vintuk and take the main road to the west, which goes to the coast, to the coastal town of Swakopmund. 
And en route, we stopped at the Novichok gold mine. Now, this is a satellite image of uh, a Google Earth image. So coming along the road here into Karabib, and you turn off the main road and come down the dirt road here, you come to the mine. And as you can see, it's an open cast mine. Now, it's not well known for mineral specimens, but it's important very economically for Namibia. Um, it, it started its operation in 1989 after being obviously prior discovered and uh, drilled and the, and the resources were proven. And um, the, it was calculated to have um, estimated resources of about one and a half to four and a half million ounces of gold. So it's the second largest gold deposit in Southern Africa after the Witwatersrand gold deposit here in South Africa. So as I say, it's important economically. And the gold occurs in quartz veins uh, that are hosted in amphibolite facies marble. And just down below here is a cartoon type sketch of uh, the geology from the paper by Kistis. And this here is the open pit. You can see, and there's very complex structure and the rocks are steeply, are steeply dipping. And there's an intrusive underneath, which may play a role in the mineralization of the gold. And these are fairly old, uh, the quartz veins in these neoproterozoic rocks. So here's the Novichok open pit mine, and you can see it's a large and a serious operation. On the left-hand side, one of the haulage ways is one of these huge trucks, which is hauling the ore out from the bottom of the pit. And the next picture is going to be a close-up on the far side of the wall, oh, sorry, um, where you can see the steeply dipping nature of those marbles. And in places also, they are intruded by dikes. This is a mafic dike, which is exposed here in the high wall. Now, as I said, not very really well known for minerals, but I included it because of the economic importance. But it has produced some things. I saw on the Arkenstone website, Rob Levinsky has got this picture of a gold specimen. It's um, a native gold, which is very rare there because the gold is finally disseminated. And then some time ago, these doubly terminated calcites came out. It was a one-off find. And this particular one I found is it's a picture on Mindat, and it belongs to the German collector at the time, Ernst. Schleichmann. And about four or five years ago, there was a very small discovery of pale green fluorite, um, but it was literally a handful of specimens. So Novichob going on to more well-known locality. We were at the mine here, so um, we move on to the Spitzkopper. So just to put it into perspective, here's the mine where we were, and we, come, we continue along the main road. There's Irongo to the north, which I'll be getting to shortly. Come along the main road and we turn off this dirt road here, goes to the coast. That's the road to Hinti's Bay. And these two mountainous areas here are the Spitzkopper. Um, the one on the right is called the Gross Spitzkopper, or the large or the giant. And the one on the left is the Klein or the Klein Spitzkopper, the small. And that's because this obviously is larger in outcrop than the other one, it is small. But what's interesting, geologically, they are virtually the same, but the mineral specimens that are known from, from the Spitzkop, uh, the silver topaz and aquamarine beryl, come almost exclusively from the Klein Spitzkop, which is interesting, there's hardly anything at the Gross. So as you turn off that road, there in the distance is the Gross Spitzkop, well-known landmark, um, but at this turn off on the main road, just here is a sign. It says the Crystals Market. Now, up here is a first day cover where you can see the Spitzkopper have actually featured on one of the stamps of Namibia. It says Gemstones SWA. This is for Southwest Africa before Namibia became independent. But on the stamps, they're showing topaz and aquamarine that are coming from this area. But this Crystal Market um, is a very good stop for tourists. Um, and it's where there's a formal setup of the local dealers and sellers who have stands and stalls there where you can buy minerals and handmade jewelry and items like that. And they're not just from the Spitzkop Ironga area, they could be from anywhere in Namibia. So if you're ever there, it's well worth a stop. And it's a good idea to also stop there because one can get a feel from all of the dealers as to what has been coming out. Uh, in more recent time. So let's drive on. So here we are. This 
picture at the top is a view of the Gross Spitzkopper, the giant, taken from the Klein. So we're looking here towards the east. And this just turning to the left shows the Klein Spitzkopper. So you can see it's not nearly as spectacular in outcrop as uh, the Gross Spitzkopper. But it's this area that has produced the specimens and the crystals like you see here. These are silver topaz. Um, the one on the right is about five centimeters. And they have been produced and for since uh, the late 1800s. Um, it's, it's a very old, well-known deposit from the early German colonial times. The topaz, the topaz comes from artisanal diggers who work there and either digging in uh, the veins, in the pegmatite veins in the granite, as you can see here in the hard rock, which isn't an easy task. That's the one source where, you, where um, they find the minerals. But the other is in the weathered alluvium. And here's a picture of um, a grandmother and her grandson who are digging just to the north of where the last picture was taken in um, the weathered soil where obviously over millennia, the topaz has come out of the granite and gets deposited. Now, we were here in July, which is winter for our part of the country. Um, but this was at about lunchtime and the temperature was already over about 40 degrees C. So they are digging in rather arduous conditions um, for these, for the topaz. Then if we just look back to the east beyond the Gross Spitzkopper, we come to probably um, one of the most well-known um, of the deposits or localities in Namibia, the Ironga Mountains. And um, we did publish an extensive article in the Monological Record um, some time ago. Um, I think it's still available. So I'm just going to show a few slides, but if you're interested, um, there's a lot more detail in the Aronga article in, in the Minrec. So I've just taken this text out of that article, um, just a little bit about the geology. In general, it's thought that the Aronga Mountains are just a mountain of granite. But in fact, there's two types of rock there. There's, um, there are lavas, there are tufts and mafic lavas, which first actually flowed out. And then these were later intruded by granitic plutons uh, called the, the um, Iranga granite. So yes, there is granite there, but the whole geological formation is called the Iranga volcanic complex. So it's a combination of lavas and also intrusive, intrusive granites. And it's been dated um, yeah, by, by, uh, by, by Pirano and others at about 132 to 135 odd million years ago. So that's the age we are looking at. So here again is a NASA satellite image. This is the Iranga. So here is that massif. And if you look carefully, you can see what a thin pencil line here coming around the west. That's one of the lava flows actually circumventing the intrusion. So the granites have intruded into some of these lavas. So the next picture I'm going to show will be here from the west, looking in towards the southwest corner of the Iranga. It's this region here that has produced the mineral specimens that are quite well known. So here it is. This is a view looking towards Iranga into this gorge or this gully. And uh, from here around to the southern part is where the local artisanal diggers for a number of years now have been actually digging and collecting minerals. So the next one will be a close-up of that view. So here it is. Of that, This is the granitic face. And I've just circled in red here. This is a, a little informal house of one of the local diggers made out of plastic sheeting and wood. They basically go up into the mountain and then they will stay for a period before they have to come down because to climb up and down every day is rather arduous. But if you look at the, at the surface, it's absolutely pockmarked with cavities. And some are natural weathering, some are from the diggings. And for example, you can see here where you see the white, there's been excavation here. There's one in the bottom right and there's one up here on this really steep slope where the rock has been gouged out going after the minerals. But some of um, the cavities are naturally weathered out because there are lots of shawl black tourmaline nests that are pervasive throughout the granite. And that's often 
what they use as an indicator to then go and dig to see if the cavity is going to widen out. And these can be quite large. He has one of the locals in one of these hollows that has been dug out into the granite. You can see it's very coarse grained. And even here, you can see some of the shawl still in situ. So this is some of the massive shawl that is uh, still in that granite. So what is sort? Well, basically beryl and its variety, aquamarine, the blue. These are all small cabinet to miniature sized odd specimens. Um, the aquamarine, the white, the goshenite, the colorless. And there's also some heliodor as well, pale yellow heliodor, and associated with quartz and with alkali feldspar and with black tourmaline. That might be shawl. I'll discuss that now. Here's some shawl. Uh, these are four specimens, and they are really excellent for the species. The, the best shawl in Southern Africa, without any doubt. V great variety of habits, forms, shapes, highly lustrous, and as I say, associated often with quartz. But I've got shawl in inverted commas because work that has been done by Skip Simmons and others, um, and this was presented in um, at the IMA conference that was held here in Johannesburg in 2014. They presented a paper. You can see they've actually probed a crystal of the black tourmaline. And yes, there is shawl, but there are other species as well, a fluorofoitite and rosmanite. So these Sure, tourmalines can be zoned with different chemical species within individual crystals. So they're not all that very simple black iron-rich tourmaline. Fluorite, well, these were had a major impact on the collector market when they came out, the so-called snake eyes or lizard eyes. This is a seven and a half centimeter cube, and they are very interesting. There's a core of, this is backlit to show the transparency. There's a core of very dark green fluorite with these windows of bright green on the side. And then it's overgrown by transparent colorless fluorite uh, cube octahedral forms. Um, and these are really bizarre and very interesting from Irongo. He has another fluorite on 25 centimeter quartz from Irongo. Again, cube octahedral. And this find, with, which is green, almost like jelly-like in its luster, with bright yellow muscovite, uh, again, came out periodically, very interesting as well. What the bright yellow color is has yet to be determined. Then Jeremy Gvite, um, these small crystals, the top left one is six millimeters, um, came out in mass um, at first, and then later, uh, not quite so plentiful. But prior to this, the only other locality for Jeremy Gvite in Namibia was mile 72, north of Swakopund, and then these came out. And although these are small, there were large ones, some up over 10 centimeters in length. So a rare mineral from a very small part of the granite. It's not dispersed over the whole area at all. And then there are cassiterite tin pegmatites round about, and this is a complex cassiterite crystal from the Iranga region. Um, ilmenite uh, was also found once, and again, this orange variety of ilmenite, uh, 5.1 centimeters with a little bit of quartz. And topaz, not as uh, plentiful as the Klein Spitzkopper, and also different habit and not <clears throat> nearly as clear or gemmy, the so-called silver topaz from Klein Spitzkopper. The Irongo ones are often included, as you see here, they've got this one has got some shawl in it, and it's associated at the bottom with these tiny little books of muscovite. Okay, so we leave Irongo and we proceed up. This is a typical road going up north <coughs> from Irongo through Amaruru on the road to Sumeb. But en route, we stop off at the Okaruzo fluorite mine. So we were down here at Irongo, and now we go up to um, Okaruza fluorite mine. Again, I, <clears throat> I have an article in the, Min, in the Min Record, which is published in 2018, which has got a lot more detail than I can talk about now. If you're interested, you can, you can see it there. So here's the road that we're on, <clears throat> and you turn off, and there's a mountain that you can see from the road here, and that's where the mine is located. 
So it was discovered early in the 1920s and obviously mined for fluorite in the 1950s. And a number of, of companies have been involved. Uh, first of all, Isco, then Okaruza Fluor Spa. Then Solvay took it over in the late 90s. And the mine finally closed in 2014. And they were producing acid-grade fluor spa for the manufacture of hydrofluoric acid. Then in 2016, Gecko Namibia acquired the mine from Solvay. And um, what is happening there at the moment when we were there in 2017, and I think it's still ongoing, is they have a plant that is processing, uh, um, they are processing graphite, which is mined not at Okarusa, but at a deposit 80 kilometers away at Okanyanda. So that's what's happening at the moment. The fluorite mine is closed. The geology, it's the largest fluorite deposit in Namibia and one of the largest in Southern Africa. And it's associated with what's called the Okaruzo alkaline complex, which is about 80 million years old, late Cretaceous. Um, and it's basically the fluorite occurs in replacement bodies in carbonatite that is intruded into uh, the older, the metasedimentary rocks of uh, the Swakop group. So on this map, which is quite busy, but I just want to show you Okaruzo, which is right up here in the far corner. If you look at these red dots coming down here yeah, uh, on the map, um, you see they are labeled as post karoo and autogenic complexes. Well, that just means they are younger than Jurassic, they're post karoo and anorogenic means they're not part of any big mountain building event. Um, and Okaruzo is one of these. And in fact, so is the Brandberg down here. And if you just look down at Iranga, where we were, you can see that some of these intrusive, yeah, the red, um, are also these um, one of these anorogenic complexes. And the green is what's called the Etten Decker group, which form, forms part of Iranga. And also here to the west of the Brandberg, which we'll get to at Gabobase. But for the moment, Okarusa. So here's the road leading up to the mine. And you can see the whole hill, mountain, is basically the mine, a large part of it. The, um, the next photo will be from up here, looking back towards the road. So yes, the, this is what's called the A pit. There were four pits that operated, A, B, C, and D, providing different qualities and types of fluorite. So that's the A pit. And again, this is the mine. It's no longer actually operational. So, And this is a, a picture taken in 2009 by Horst Windisch when it was still operating. So that pillar you see here is this one here during the operating mine. So we were allowed into the deep pit uh, very kindly and are, uh, allowed to fossick and to actually dig around. So here you can see some of our group for scale. And if you look up in the high wall of the pit, you can see these dikes that have intruded in here. So it's quite complex geology. And it's brecciated throughout. You can see here are fragments of uh, the carbonatite with this veining and cementing in between, which is very vuggy. And it's in these cavities and vugs that uh, the minerals, the fluorite, and others, but primarily fluorite occurs. So while we were there for probably an hour and a half or so, I, these are two specimens I just picked up. They're quite small, three, three and a half centimeters, but there's a little quartz with a green fluorite on the side, and there's quartz with some guthite and fluorite. So in the rubble on the floor of the mine, um, there are some things that can be found. Obviously not large, iconic, commercial type of specimens, you know, like these. Yes, a typical fluorite, it's green. Um, this is again cuboctahedral, and it's got some, uh, these were pyrites, which have now, have now altered to guthite. Um, cuboctahedral. And again, interesting features on these, how the cubic faces are relatively clean and smooth, whereas the octahedral faces are somewhat etched. So that's an interesting texture on the surface of the crystals. Here's another typical Okaruza fluorite from uh, the early 1980s, again backlit, very commonly color zone, purple to blue to the green core. It's a small, uh, small cabinet specimen. And then these, it's what's called the Harlequin fluorite. And there's quite a few of these in my article that uh, we show. These were mined and then very carefully over a period of time, the matrix at the back was slowly worked off until only the fluorite remained and they were transparent. And then you backlight them like this, like a lampshade. And they show this really truly spectacular um, form and color. Uh, and if you just look, for example, here, here's a cube. Um, and internally, 
the the cube, the purple cube, is at is at forty five degrees to the overgrow, and the corners are dark blue, and you see that throughout. Really, really dramatic and interesting fluorites. He has another fluorite, a yellow fluorite from the nineteen seventies, with the corners only that are a reddish a reddish purple color. Now, most of the fluorite that's found at Okaruza, a lot of it is coated by thin films of chalcedony and guthite, and this is normally removed with hydrofluoric acid. Sometimes um, it can be quite nice if it's not removed. And this is exactly one of those pieces. This is an uncleaned specimen with a white, uh, chalced um, very thin chalcedony on top of the fluorite. He has another blue fluorite with um, creamy colored calcite around the periphery. I suspect that it was completely coated and that's been manually picked off to leave this halo around it. Calcite is not that common. Um, this is a nice specimen uh, in my collection of pseudo hexagonal calcite. Um, and actually, I acquired this at the Muni show in uh, 2012 from one of the German dealers. Here's another uncleaned, in inverted commas, specimen, which I prefer actually, the fluorite is coated by this almost iridescent guthite and then draped over by the white calcite, giving a very nice contrast of textures and color. And then rare, but occasionally small barites have been found, as you see here, the yellow barite uh, with the quartz. And um, I don't have a picture, but once off blue celestine also occurred at um, Okaruza. So that's, Okaruzo, and we hit the road to the northernmost point of our trip, which goes up to Sumeb. Now, obviously, Sumeb is a topic all on its own, so I can only show you a few slides, and obviously the mine is closed. It's no longer mining. And um, we spent two nights at um, the Minan Hotel, very famous. The bar, the pub in the hotel in years gone by was, um, if you read some of the books and the publications, the scene of many mineral wheeling and dealings amongst miners and dealers and collectors, but it's a very comfortable hotel. It was revamped and refurbished shortly before we arrived. So here's a view from my room window looking out into the garden. So that's where we were. And this again is a Common photo seen by people who go there, the one of the streets in Sumeb with the headgear, the Devet shaft, virtually in the middle of town. There's two shafts. One is the Devet shaft, and the other is the Friedrich Wilhelm or FW Kegel shaft shown here with some of the old mine buildings, um, obviously a bit dilapidated now in the foreground. Now, Sumeb, as I'm sure a lot of you know, has produced a plethora of minerals, and it's in this diagram here, which comes from the sumeb.com website. It's a bit busy, but it just shows you a, a cross-section, and they're the two shafts. Um, the reason why so many of the minerals came from this mine over its more or less 100-year history is because there were three oxidation zones where these minerals could actually form. The, the first was from basically the surface down to about the 11th level. Then there was a second oxidation zone with what's called the north break zone. This feature coming down here, there was a second oxidation zone here from about the 25th to the 30th to the 30th level, so there. And then there was a third oxidation level towards the end of the mine down here uh, from the 41st level onwards down to the 44th level. So these multiple zones of oxidation uh, produced the magnificent specimens that we know. So I'll just show you a few randomly chosen ones that I quite like. This is a cerocyte. Uh, nine centimeters, partly coated around the periphery with rosazite. This is an azurite, of which there are superb azurites. Um, this was an advert in the mineralogical record for Desmond Sacco. Um, this is a native copper on calcite with mimetite. Sometimes one sees coppers labeled from Sumeb when they might be from Unganya. Um, they, they do look a bit different, but sometimes it's not that easy. But when you start getting associations with mimetite, there's no doubt about it because you don't get mimetite at Ungania. Hydrocerocyte, um, the lead carbonate hydroxide, this is uh, the white film, uh, the milky white film totally coating um, the reticulated cerocyte. Then Ludlakite, 
this was one of the f- early formed found specimens, not the later ones from that lower oxidation zone. Uh, and it's a really large piece associated with the Zincian siderite. This particular specimen is in a local South African museum. Then just a accumulation of some of the interesting minerals. This is azurite with wilfenite and with malachite, uh, four centimeters. And then barite, uh, not terribly abundant. And most of the barite tended to be a brown or chocolate brown color, a bit like the one you see here. When the crystals got smaller, uh, they could be transparent and gemmy like amber. Then this piece, which is quite interesting, uh, the black coating you see here on the underlying calcite was first thought to be heterogenite, the cobalt oxide, but later proved to be guthite. So this guthite coated the calcite below and then was overgrown by this gemmy white and yellow calcite and then itself supplanted by dioptase on top. It's quite an interesting association of the minerals and also the color combination. And then smithsonite, I just chose this. There's green smithsonite, pink, yellow, all different colors. This is a cupra smithsonite, uh, 10.6 odd centimeters. We have to stop here for Sumer because we, we just, uh, you can't go on forever. So then from Sumer, we drove down south to Berg Arcus. Um, but en route, one, if you go there, you should stop off and see the Hober meteorite. This is this iron meteorite um, estimated to weigh about 60 tons, and that impacted the Earth about 80,000 years ago. And uh, here's our group you can see behind it for scale. So um, that is a pretty big meteorite <laughs> to have hit the Earth there, and it's one of the national monuments now. So obviously you cannot uh, try to take pieces off it, although – before it was declared, some of it was actually sampled. And you can see on the side here where it's been sawn off. And these were legally acquired samples uh, at the time. I think uh, it was during the 1950s, actually. We filled up at a gas station in Grootfontein on the way to Bergalkes. And I saw this sign stuck up in the shop at, at the gas station. It says, I'm looking for a taxi driver urgently. NB, must have a driver's license. Now, <laughs> that may seem a bit unusual, but not too unusual, uh, actually, but uh, it makes you wonder about driving around in a taxi um, in that part of the world, how safe it is. But back Alcus, so there, Grootfontein, uh, you drive out here to the largest vanadium mine or the largest, uh, let's say, supplier of descloisite in the world, but basically a lead-zinc vanadium mine. And uh, in... The March-April issue of Rocks and Minerals of this year, I actually published this article. So again, if you want to see more detail, um, please have a look at it. Um, just while I've got, this is the double page spread of the article. Um, this is the photo I took on our trip, and it's a panoramic view of um, the old dump here. Here's a person for scale, here are vehicles. And off there, far in the distance, is the one shaft at Bergalkes. Um, and I'll show you a section in a while. But we spent a couple of hours there, and there are some things to be found actually lying around, not spectacular like this disclosed out here, which you see a photo of Jess Gofels, but still some interesting things. The mine closed in the late 1970s, and a friend of mine, Graham Gavin, was the geologist in those last couple of years, and he had a few photos taken from the air. So this is the mine when it was still operating in its last dying years. And you can see there's a there's a plant here, there's a processing plant and the workings in the front. And he has a hill where there was the original open cast. And just off to the left is where um, we stopped behind uh, the dump. So this is the geology of Bach Arcus. Um, it's essentially within a dolomitic succession, a dollar stone succession. Um, <clears throat> the people who have worked there have identified different types of dolomites and the dollar stones. And the mineralization, uh, what's called the northern ore horizon, is this thin belt coming along the contact of uh, this laminated dollar stone with uh, the blue one. And then there's the central ore body, the red, and then a depth down here is what is called the hanging wall ore body. And you can see there's these two old open pits um, that were mined here when the mine first started, and then, and then it went underground uh, down to about the 19th level. 
And underground, there are also in the Dolomites massive caves, which obviously accounts for a lot of the crystals. So here's just some shots of uh, what we found lying around. This is a lump of rock with the red massive discloisite and some vanadinite, but not much. This is some of the dollar stone, very hard cemented with veins of dolomite and tiny vogues with hemimorphite. Now, at the moment, when we were there anyway, and I think it still might be, the mine facility, the buildings, has been taken over by um, an educational center, a training center, and you have to get permission to go there, which is what we did. Um, otherwise, you can't get onto the property. What's maybe not well known, unlike Sumeb, there are sites from Bergharkus, and these are a couple that come from the late 1950s. They're not as spectacular as the Sumeb ones, but... Interesting nonetheless, and a little bit different, often associated with willamite, this needle-like willamite. Um, and there's a twin, a twin specimen down there. Um, and then the discloisite, I just took this with the caption out of my article because it explains a little bit about the complexity of the specimen. It's rather complex. There are these three different stages of growth of the discloisite. And the mineralization is recent, geologically speaking, because in some of the caves, in the Dolomites, there are fossil bones of um, prehistoric animals, and some of the bones are coated by the disclosite, which obviously tells you, geologically, it's relatively young. This is a typical disclosite, um, a, um, a miniature specimen, spear-shaped crystals, highly lustrous, this little dendritic, almost like a tree thumbnail, a bit larger than a thumbnail, showing these branches. And you can see when the crystals start to get thin and small, they become transparent uh, to translucent. And the color of the discloisite varies from red through amber to brown to black metallic. Smithsonite, also some very fine smithsonites, although not abundant, came from there. This is one which is in my collection, and it's a yellow smithsonite showing these radiating semi-parallel ROMs. And then this really good specimen, um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Schofield kindly allowed me to use the picture in my article. At the time when he took the photo, it belonged to Stuart Walensky. I don't know if that's still the case, but this green um, smithsonite on the dolomite matrix, and that's a Bach Alka specimen, not um, Sumeb. This is, again, a smaller one, uh, Smithsonite, this sort of steel gray, transparent ROMs, um, a little thumbnail specimen. And then willamite um, occurs uh, in crystals up to uh, about eight, eight mils, maybe a centimeter. There's at least four different stages of willamite crystallization in the deposit from the very early form to the very late form. And the collector type species like this are the last to form. So here's a sample I picked up on the dump, and it's rather fortuitous because it's, um, it's 12 centimeters and it's got almost everything in one sample. So here's the sphalerite, this yellow color, that's the zinc ore, and here's the disclosite. There's a little sericite inside this pocket. There's the willamite and there's the smithsonite. Now, some of these actually fluoresce. So the next slide is the same piece under 365 nanometer convoy long wave light. So that's the, piece, uh, that's the specimen under normal light. That's it under UV. So you can see the sphalerite is reacting that color. The willamite is orange, and the smithsonite up at the top is yellow. So that's actually quite nice and attractive, and especially for a piece just collected on the dump. Okay, we leave the confines of the Otavi mountain land, and um, we then did a bit of a tourist trip uh, for a couple of days to this part of the country, um, but I'll just show you, we went to Grootberg, big mountain, Grootberg, um, because that is a mineral locality for especially zeolites. This is an interesting trip because we stayed where we were camping at uh, Korichas, and the trip we drove around in that loop was about 450 kilometers in one day on dirt roads that were bone shakingly corrugated, and uh, it, was a, it was an interesting drive, to say the least. So here's that dirt road leaving, leading up to the Grootberg Pass. It's the pass that goes over these mountains, 
And these are the Etendeka larvas. They are basalts. They're Cretaceous in age. And once you get to the top, there's a lodge where you can have accommodation or meal or a coffee. And this is standing on the veranda, looking back down the valley. Very nice. So Fjordbach is known for still bites. Um, and you can find them if you're lucky, actually, in outcrops still. They need to be cleaned, though. So there's a stillbite specimen in a small geode. And you have some stillbite crystals attached to stalactitic quartz. Um, one of the tourist stops uh, between Grootberg and Korichas is what's called the finger clip, the finger stone. And that's it here. And there you can see some of our party for scale just on the slope here. It's basically an erosional remnant. This photo at the top is taken from up here at the Fingerstone, looking out across. There's our vehicles down in the valley. The Uchab River has been flowing through here for millennia, and it's eroded into the sediments, leaving these terraces. And this outcrop is the one remaining little stub or finger of one of these terraces that will ultimately, obviously, also get weathered away. So on south to Kabobasek the famed locality for amethyst, amongst other things. If you go there, there's an old mining town called Ois. It's actually um, a village that was developed um, when there was a mine open there to mine tin or cassiterite. And here you see the old open cast Ois tin mine just on the edge of, of, of the actual village. But there's the Brandberg rest camp here. It's actually quite comfortable. You can stay there. And that's what we did. And then you drive out to um, the Brandberg and to Gabobasep. And en route, again, some of these dealer tables, um, not much high quality. In fact, a lot of it is actually, in fact, um, the lapidary material. But if you dig around, there's some interesting things to be found. So here's a NASA satellite image. This is the Brandberg that you see here. It's, again, one of these intrusive granites. And the highest point in Namibia um, 8,550 feet or 2,850 meters. Kunigstein is at the top of the Brandberg. Now, initially, some of the minerals that came from here were labeled as Brandberg, but in fact, they come from this area to the west. This mountainous terrain here is Gabobaseb. These are the Gabobaseb Mountains. And down here is the Messon Crater. So this is the locality that produces the specimen, although some Amethyst, quartz, topaz has been collected in the Brandberg per se, but that actually is a proclaimed area and it's protected. So, in fact, it's illegal to collect minerals there. So, here's a view of Gabobasek. So, driving out there, this hill here is Table Mountain. It's called Tafel Kup, Table Mountain. So, you drive off the road here and you drive into these valleys and you meet up with some of the local artisanal diggers who are busy mining there for minerals. Well, not mining, they are digging. But just to look at the geology for a moment of the Gabobasep Mountains, this is um, Milner and Ewitt's paper. So here's the Brandberg, here's Gabobasep. Up north here is Etendeka, that's where Grootberg was. But here's a vertical column through this succession of volcanics. It's about 600 meters. And the lower part, what's called the Tafelkop basalts, are overlain by quartz latites. And it's these basalts at the lower part of uh, the succession that contain the minerals. So here we are now at the area of um, some of the diggings, looking back towards the Brandberg. There it is in the distance. And in the foreground here are these plants, Wellwitchia and Mirabilis. And these are you might know, very interesting. They are, in a sense, inverted commas, prehistoric. Some of these are over a thousand years old. And what looks like quite a complex plant, there's actually only two leaves on this plant. There's a, there's a core in the middle where the leaf slowly grows out of, and as it gets longer and longer in the wind, the wind blows here, yeah, the, the edges get tattered, and they get mixed up into a whirl and get actually knotted. But they're very hard and they're very leathery. And they're male and female plants as well. So and they're endemic to the Namib. They, go, they occur from north, you know, just in the southern part of Angola, all the way down south into um, just north of the Namib plains. So this is where the locals um, who are digging there, this picture is a few years old, 
but they build their rudimentary abodes in the in the middle of nowhere. It's about 50 or so kilometers to west. There's no water, nothing. They have to go in there to get food, and it's very hot. The summer, the temperatures here get into the high 40s. Uh, so it's not a very pleasant place to live, and especially when you have no proper facilities or heating or air conditioning. So here we are on our trip, talking to some of um, the locals. If you go there, depending on the time, uh, they may or may not have specimens, depends who's been, but they have these boxes and you can look at quartz and amethyst and various things and can barter. Um, and that's uh, actually not a bad way to get the minerals. Here's one of the cavities that has been excavated that we're just having a look in. And if you just look at some of the rubble, you can see the basalt here. You can see the white amygdales. That's absolutely pockmarked with these. And obviously, when they get larger, that's where the minerals come from. So here are some examples, um, just of a few of them. The quartz, this is quartz with hematite inside, with a faceted uh, stone. This is, a this is a doubly terminated quartz with a reverse little scepter on the top. Here is a quartz amethyst in a well-trimmed calcite matrix, nine centimeters. There's a large piece, 19 centimeters, and it, and it indicates some of the sometimes bizarre and complex forms. It's quartz, which has got scepters of smoky quartz and amethyst, which themselves are doubly terminated. And then there's this strange beast, which I like to call uh, the dog. Um, and it's not manufactured, it's natural, with the head of the animal being the scepter and with amethyst the tail and with quartz with hematite here as the legs. It's, there's some truly bizarre shaped specimens that come from there. The other well-known mineral is prenite, uh, which comes from the diggings. Here's a prenite geode with some quartz, and here's one of these radiating whirls. Bearite, small but rare, but it does occur there. Um, so that's Kabobasep. Then we head on south towards the end of our trip, and we go to the old Gorob mine, which is in the middle of the Nama Park. You need a permit to go there, which we have. Here's the old god of mine. And I'm just showing these because I actually worked here as a student in 1975. It was a copper prospect that was being drilled by BNO Exploration at the time, but it was first investigated in the early 1900s by the Germans. So this is the ruins of the camp. That's the room I spent two months in. The field geologist, that was his, his room. The other assistant was there, and that was our storeroom. It was a fantastic experience to spend two months in the Nama Desert. And what's interesting there are the storolite crystals that one sees in the schist. So here's an outcrop of some, and you see the stubby crystals. They're a bit weathered. But when we were there in 1975, and this is the picture of me with my friend, um, for some other reason, the early Germans had hand-cobbed thousands of storolite crystals out of the schist. And there were these two heaps there that we used to spend our weekends going through looking for the twin crystals. And when we went there in 2017, there's not one crystal left. It's obviously been depleted by whoever. But these are just five of the specimens that I collected at the time on that dump. Then we go down south along the Namib Sea. So I'll just the sand sea, and I'll show you a few slides. This is uh, at Sosis Flay, magnificent dunes. At sunset, there's a person for scale. We climbed up to the top of this, which is quite nice. The view from up there is spectacular. This is an old ruined farmhouse with an, with an outcliff mountains in the background. Photographer's paradise. And uh, one of the scenic shots at sunset going along one of the dirt roads. And there's obviously game to be seen. Here's a Gemsbok, an oryx, which is adapted for life in the desert. The final stop was down south, right on the border, close to the border with South Africa at Roshpina. This is the road, thank goodness, paved road going down towards Roshpina. And again, my friend Alan Fraser and I have written a, a paper in Rocks and Minerals um, on Roshpina. I think it was 2012, I think. I'm not quite sure now. Um, some of the minerals are not that well known, perhaps, but um, from the Gossen, they were these sort of uh, rice-like yellow smithsonite, small V-twin sericite, only one and a half centimeters. And in the, in the main ore body, uh, bearite and marcosite. And it's the bearite, actually, that made this mine famous. In 1990, these orange bearites came out huge, over 22 centimeters, and these bright yellow that are arguably uh, some of the best bearites from southern Africa. 
He has the mine operating in 2017 in the foothills, the Rosh Pina mine. We didn't get to go to the mine. But if you ever go there, the geologist who's retired and who lives there, Gisela Hinda, has a geocenter, which is well worth a visit. She runs a museum there, and you can go in and see all sorts of displays of all sorts of minerals. And this is the shelf of her Rosh Pina specimens, showing again some of the bearites and smithsonites. Then we hit the road again on the way home, dirt road, corrugations. One of the uh, shortcomings of a dirt road is this happens. It's often advisable to carry two spare tires, depending on where you're going in Namibia. And still more dirt roads heading on home until finally we got to the south east corner of Namibia and we left and hit the road back to Johannesburg. And by this stage, we felt like the cat we saw at Sestrin um, in need of a good nap. But it was, for me, a really fantastic trip. They were, it was our, a large part of our geology department who went, very knowledgeable geologists, some who work in Namibia with research projects and students. And we all learned a lot actually from each other. So thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate it. And if you ever have the opportunity I would say, even if you're not interested in minerals, it's well worth going as a tourist. So thank you very much.